Hello, this is Daniel Meyer, pastor of First Baptist Church in River Falls, Wisconsin. It's great to have you all tuning in this morning to Blessed Over Radio broadcast. Today's message is titled, Building Up Yourselves. I hope that these next few minutes are a blessing to all of you and that you hear from God as I relay this message that he has given to me to give to you. Good morning. I invite you to turn your Bible to the General Epistle of Jude. The General Epistle of Jude. We've been making our way through this epistle for quite some time now, all summer. That summer's just about over. We're about ready to finish this epistle here in the coming weeks. We've got down as far as verse 19. We talked last time about verse number 19, about them that have not the Spirit, those that were separated and sensual. And we talked about how we try them and how we understand when someone doesn't have the Spirit. And if what they say doesn't match the words of God, then we know that they're not following the Holy Spirit. They're void of the Spirit that we desire them to follow. And so when somebody gets up and makes certain comments that are anti-biblical, though they might sound right, though they might tell you that they're doing the Lord's work, when those commandments and those words that they're actually saying go contrary to what the Bible actually says, then you know they're not doing the Lord's work. That's what we're talking about. Oftentimes a politician will, will cite a scripture and take it out of context and try to convince everybody that they're doing the Lord's work. Meanwhile, they're all for doing things that are contrary to what God would do. And that's just one way in a secular environment. Now we've got down to verse number 20. The Bible says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's what we're doing. We're waiting eternal life. We have access to eternal life. We have the ticket for eternal life if you're born again, if you've been saved. You have that ticket. We're waiting to arrive in heaven. We have the ticket that gives us access to that eternal life. According to the book of Ephesians, we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we have that. We're just waiting for the fulfillment of the eternal life. Way back when we started at verse number three, we had talked about the love of God. And we had made mention of the fact that over here in verse 20 and 21, we can find the Trinity. It's so important that we understand God's love. The purpose of God's love is to inspire the purpose of God's love was for us to see the, the Savior and the work of the Savior. And we can see this grand design through the ages in these two verses as we can see the Trinity. And there's so many non-Trinitarians out there, those that don't believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, those people that deny 1 John 5, 7. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Non-Trinitarians don't have that verse. They make sure that they got a Bible that doesn't have that verse because they don't like the fact that there's a Trinity and they can't comprehend the Godhead. And so they, they cut that out. But notice what the Holy Spirit has done through his work of the Bible as he's given us other opportunities, other places, other cross-references in which we can take people to and show them the Trinity. And we can see the Trinity here in verse 20 and 21 of Jude. What we find in verse 21, we find the Father. Notice it says the love of God. When we read the love of God, the love of God should take us to John 3.16. For God so loved the world, you should be able to see the Father right there. We're in verse 21. Notice we can see the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Son. So we've seen the Father and the Son in verse 21. We go back to verse number 20. You can see the Holy Ghost. That's the third part of the Godhead. So in these two verses, you can see the Trinity. There's so many people out there that can't see the Trinity, and as a Bible believer, and if you spend time witnessing, you're going to need some of these other references so that you can take people to them, and so they'll have to come up with a way to refute the Trinity. And I don't know how they're going to be able to do it when it's right there in plain sight. Now this morning, we're going to be talking about building up yourselves. We're going to talk about building, and how God wants to build us up, and how God's going to grow us, and God's going to work us, and God's going to exercise us in our faith to make our faith become stronger, more vibrant, tangible, something that's concrete that we can lay hold of in a time of need. That's what he's talking about in building up yourselves. The whole purpose of this epistle, as we've seen back in verse number three, was contending for the faith and then taking time to put all these things in remembrance that early believer was to know, just like today. It hasn't changed. God still thinks that we should know. We should know every, every bit that we've talked about, maybe not in quite the detail that we've spent time looking at it, but it's here, it's mentioned. You have the opportunity to go back into the Old Testament or the New Testament and find these passages and dig them out so that you can what? Build up your faith. The idea is not just to have head knowledge. 
But the idea is to have the knowledge to be able to put it into practice so that, for instance, when you run into the non-Trinitarian, you can take them to another couple passages and then leave it to them to try to refute how do you get around the Godhead there. Because as we've seen in 1 John 5, 7, it's there. We see here in Jude verse 20 21, it's there. There's lots of passages in the scripture. And you as a Bible student ought to take the time to mark them so that you know where they're at in a time of need. You mark them now when you don't need them. Then you'll have them right at your fingertips. And remember, oh, I know it was over here. And there's lots of passages in both Testaments that teach us about the Trinity. And Jude isn't focusing in on that. He just made sure to point out the fact that it was there for us. And so this morning as we talk about building up yourselves, take some time to make sure that we really pray in the Holy Ghost. And so let's go to the Lord. Father, we ask you to help us this morning. We ask you to help us to take this time and use it so that we could build up our faith, so that we could deepen our relationship with you, so that we could have true understanding of your word. And Lord, that you'd help us as you grow us to become more mature in our walk with you as we become mature in our faith. We'd have something tangible that we could have others run to in a time of need. They'd be able to see that stronghold, that shelter, and they would understand what it is that we're clinging to. Lord, ask that you just take this time and use it wisely. We ask this in your Son's name. Jesus, amen. From verse 20 down through the rest of the epistle, Jude gives us basically seven final commands. And in these final commands, there are basically laws and warnings that he's pointing us to. And as you study the Bible, you'll learn suddenly that there's over 212 plain laws and warnings. And I suspect that there's even more than that as they're going to match according to Jewish tradition. And depending on how you count, in the Bible, there are 613 commandments. And these 613 commandments are supposed to match the little seeds that you find in a pomegranate. And so you take the time to cut a pomegranate in half and then count all those little seeds, you're to come up with 613 commandments. And so when you study the Bible, you find out in these 613 commandments, you find out that there's 365 negative commandments. And that 365 negative commandments matches the number of arteries that the human body has, as well as the number of days in a year, 365. That leaves us with 248. Oh, but there's 248 affirmative precepts, and those precepts match the members of the human body, giving us 613. I find it fascinating that they've, they've taken the time to study that out, and I find it fascinating as you spend more and more time in the Bible, that 212 plain laws and warnings, I bet you it's a lot more. I bet you it's a lot more than just the 212. So I, as I keep studying, I just keep counting them and keep marking them. And guess what? That number keeps growing. And how fitting that Jude here is teaching us that very first commandment, that very first warning here, is that we what? Is that we build up yourselves. We need to spend time building. We need to spend time building our faith. We need to spend time building with God. And we find this over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Notice what we see here. He says in verse number three, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Paul's warning to Timothy was to make sure that Timothy spent time teaching doctrine, teaching things that were going to be valuable to the, the body of Christ. Not this idea that they're going to spend time in fables and myths, and there's a whole bunch of other warnings. Peter talks about it, and Paul told Titus about it. And so basically there's, there's warnings that come about teaching endless genealogies. Endless genealogy is not what we did when we went through Genesis chapter number 5. But an endless genealogy is an endless discussion of ancestry. That'd be the commandments of men. That's what Paul told Titus. He warned Titus about teaching the commandments of men. Titus 1, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So this idea would be endless discussion of ancestry. There's also the idea that there's uh, the length of descent of Greek and Gnostic mythologies. People often uh, try to study that stuff out. I, I wrote the list of popes as an endless genealogy, as a fable. Notice that there's a, a prophecy out there where I spend time talking about it. There could be the omnibus of names compiled by Mormons of the unbaptized sinners so that they can baptize the dead and get them into heaven. That'd be an endless genealogy going back, trying to figure out who's saved, who, who's not saved, who didn't get baptized, how can we get them into heaven, how can we baptize them though they're dead. That'd be an 
endless genealogy. That'd be a fable not worth following. The Baptist writers fall into that pattern, that category. The idea that you need to be able to trace your lineage back to the ministry of John the Baptist. And so if you're not baptized by somebody who wasn't baptized by somebody who wasn't baptized down through the ages by John the Baptist, then you can't possibly be part of the true bride of Christ. That's the Baptist briderism in a nutshell. And guess what? That would consist of this endless genealogy. It'd be a waste of time. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. He said, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. And you remember the early church was had this battle of who was saved by who, who was baptized by who, and they were all excited if they were, they were converts of Paul or Apollos and had these divisions. But you want to know what? That's a complete waste of time as well. And so we ought not to spend time building ourselves up in that. Rather, we should be spending our time building up in the faith, spending time with God, not spending time in this area of endless genealogies, this area that is going to what? It's going to gender to strife. Today, a large portion of our society is given over to ancestry, trying to figure out who who they came from and, and all of that stuff. And you want to know what? That just gets to be more and more and more like a fable, consuming more and more and more of your time. And in the end, it's not going to mean much of anything. Rather, we should be spending our time in, in faith. Faith produces edification. Fables produce questions. It's good to have Bible questions. It's good to make notes in your Bible about things you don't understand. But faith is going to produce edification. Faith is going to encourage someone else in your church. Faith is going to encourage someone else in your family when they see that you tell them, oh, I just read, I just read a whole book of the Bible. And they're going to be excited because that's going to be a way of encouragement. Secondly, Jude tells us here in verse 20 that we should be praying in the Holy Ghost. We should be spending time in prayer. Notice how close to the top prayer is. Building is, spending time with God, doing the things that are right. Then he tells us, boy, praying. We ought to spend time praying. We ought to understand what God is trying to to do in our lives. Notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. The Bible says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I take people here all the time. Teach me how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what the needs are. You're going to run across in your life lots of complicated things that people want prayer for, and you're not going to know how to pray. But what you do have is you have a Holy Spirit that's able to help you. You have the power of the Holy Ghost that's able to get things done. He's able to make utterings that you don't even know. You should note here that the new Bibles omit and change or alter the word itself. Notice it says there, but the Spirit itself, they alter that. They take it out and they change it to himself or they leave it out. And then they violate all grammatical rules when translating because the Holy Spirit is always neutered. He's always neutered. Best way to teach that to somebody is Genesis chapter 24. We can see that Abraham, a type of the father, sends his unknown, unnamed servant Now, we might suppose that that is um, Eliezer, who we read about in chapter 15, but in chapter 24, that servant is not named. An unnamed servant to go get a bride for Isaac, who is a type of Christ. So in that passage, guess what you have? You have another example of the Trinity. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. Man, you can't get away from that. And yet people still claim that there is no Trinity. So we see here in this verse, Romans that we have the Holy Spirit that helps us, that he makes groanings which cannot be uttered. He knows He knows how to pray for that which we know not how to pray. There's going to be some complicated times in your life where you do not know the best way to pray for somebody. And oftentimes when I'm confronted with this situation where I don't know how to pray, I pray for them. And I say, God, you know what the situation is. God, you know how to answer it. You know how to show yourself best in that part. And that's how I pray. Because I don't know, but God knows. Bible says that we know not what to pray. But isn't that what Jude is teaching us? That we're building ourselves up in our most holy faith? Praying in the Holy Ghost. He also teaches us that, you know what? With, we must serve the Lord. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. In a sense, Paul is going to give to the Ephesians the same thing that we're looking at here in Jude about building and about praying. Notice what he says here in verse number 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know who we're strong in? We're strong in the Lord. That's who we're strong in. 
We're strong in a God that cannot lie. We're strong in a God that cannot change. We're strong in a God that does not lie, who's not going to flee, who's always going to be there, who's always going to help us in the power of his might. And we've seen his might come over and over and over. His might is in inherent power or force. And the power is the exercise of that force. Verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. A wile, of course, you know, is a trick or a strategy practiced for ensnaring or deception. It's a sly or insidious artifice. You know what you need? You need the whole armor to avoid that insidious artifice. Whole armor means you need every piece. It's the only way that we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're attacked by an angelic tempter, Satan. And Satan, through the Bible, uses many schemes. He often uses disunity. He often uses personal sin. He uses false teachers. We've seen that a lot in the book of Jude. He uses discouragement. He uses apathy. He uses apostasy. He uses suffering. I mean, the list goes on and on. These are just some of the things that the recipients of that letter faced, Ephesians. However, the believer cannot attribute all sin and problems to the angelic tempter. Fallen mankind, even the redeemed, guess what we have? We have a continuing sin nature. Isn't that why Jude told us to contend for the faith? Isn't that why Jude told us a warning about lasciviousness? Isn't that why Jude warned us about all those things? So we can see the continuing sin nature. We can see the fallen world system. All you have to do is look around. I never thought in my lifetime that we would see cities burning across America like you used to see on the nightly news from third world countries. Now we see it right here in America, city after city burning. You know what that points to? That points to a fallen world system. Obviously, we can see the angelic or devilish tax. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not a contest. This is an all-out war. And the church, the church needs to be militant because they have on the whole armor of God. As you'll learn suddenly, part of the armor is not going to be sufficient. Only having one piece is not going to get the job done. We've got to have all of it. We often engage with an adversary that we cannot see. Principalities, that's evil spirits, who like the angels are divided into ranks and a hierarchy. Powers, those are thrones, dominions, princedoms. Rulers of darkness of this world, that's the emblem of ignorance, misery, sin. And no description could be more accurate than that of representing these malignant spirits as ruling over a dark world. Spiritual wickedness. Is that wicked spirits? No, that's not wicked spirits. No, it's they're working in high places. It's them working in positions where you wouldn't think that they, they should be. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 2? Remember Eli, the high priest slash judge of Israel? His sons, Hopni and Phinehas? You know what they were working? They were working spiritual wickedness in high places. You couldn't get any higher place back then than working in the tabernacle of God. And yet there they were, and we've already talked about their disgusting and lascivious practice. Verse 13, he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice he says it again. He told us in verse 11. He's telling us again in verse 13, you're going to have to take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So God is equipping us with armor, not to run, not to flee, to stand, to stand stalwart. That's what he's given us the armor for. He repeats himself so that we recognize the power that's in the armor. Guess what? Enemies can take your armor. The stand is a military term to hold your position. Quote from my Bible that says, Never doubt in the night what God gave you in the light. Stand. God wants us to stand. He doesn't want us to flee. He doesn't want us to move. He wants us to stand. And obviously we can look around today and see an evil day. That evil day could be a day of temptation, could be a whole evil age in which we live, could be a day of adversity. But in doing all the stand, that means we have proper preparation. That means that we're consistent. That means that knowledge is crucial. That's what Jude's been telling us. Remember the words of the apostles, verse 17. Put this in remembrance. So you once knew this, verse number 5. As I often cite, Romans 15, verse 4. The things that were written aforetime were written for your learning, knowledge. We're going to have to have that knowledge. Going to have to have that. He says, stand, verse 14, therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. It means we got to make sure that we understand the truth and we have to make sure that our chest is covered with the righteousness of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 eight. Notice he says, 
Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's the word of God. That means having your feet quipped. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings. Peace is the opposite of war. The best way to put war down, best way to put conflict down, confrontation down, is to use the very words of God. You're going to use the words of the Prince of Peace, who's giving you the Holy Spirit of comfort, giving you that peace that passes what all understanding. You've got to have it. Verse 16, and above all, that means more so than taking the the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, more than having your loins gored with the truth, more than having your breastplate covered with righteousness. He says, above all, take the shield of faith, the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Shields back in the day were generally made of wood with leather coverings surrounded by metal. It was soaked in water before battle so as to extinguish the fire-tipped arrows. It's a symbol of full protection. And you're going to say, well, it doesn't really, where are you getting at about soaking it in water? Well, read the rest of the verse. Taking the shield of faith, where you be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. That means the adversary uses a ranged weapon. that he lobs those darts at all of us all day long. Just keeps lobbing them. Here comes sin. Here comes lust. Here comes apostasy. Here comes the fact you're tired. He just keeps lobbing them. And if you don't have a shield of faith, if you don't have the right shield, then you're not equipped to what? Capture all of those darts and extinguish them. That's what needs to be taking place. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So you have to have the helmet of salvation. You have to be sure that you're saved. Today, construction workers wear hard hats. People that ride motorcycles generally wear helmets. Race car drivers wear helmets. Soldiers wear helmets. Why? You're protecting the the biggest and best asset. If you take a head wound and get hit in the head, you can be eliminated. You're going to have to make sure that you have the helmet of salvation. Why is that so important? Because the devil, when he starts attacking you, he's going to try to convince you that you're not saved. That's where he goes. So you have to make sure that you have your, your head covered with salvation so that you understand. That's 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written that you may know that you have eternal life. See, God wants you to know that you could know that you could know that you have eternal life. And he says, take the sword of the Spirit. That's the word of God. That's what we've been talking about. That's your feet prepared and having a sword. That's the very words of God. You need all of that. So that what? So that you can pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Many times I think as believers we go out and we're not fully equipped. Yeah, 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 we're saved and we have the helmet of salvation, but I'm going to go out and I'm not going to take the sword of the Spirit. I'm not going to take my shield today. I'm not going to spend time meditating on the Word of God. My feet aren't going to be equipped, but I've got my loins covered with the truth. I'm good. I'm good to go. And that's not going to work. That is not going to work. We have to make sure that we spend time always being prepared. Notice he says in this verse, praying always. Always is time. He tells us the manner in which we should pray. That's supplication and prayer. The object of our prayer, verse 18, is the the saints, all saints, not just some, all saints. The method is in the Spirit. Personal request, that's speaking boldly. And in the Spirit, that's watching and praying for the believers. That's what we should be doing. Now, he says back there in verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. We find in the Bible the love of God is used 12 times. We find that the Pharisees would rather tithe than show the love of God. And we find that in the book of Luke. We also know that Jesus knows those that do not have the love of God, John chapter 5. We recognize that keeping his word allows the love of God to perfect us, 1 John 2, 5. Why is that so important? We learned back in verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remembering the words. Remembering the words perfects us. And by being perfected, guess what? We're building. Not only are we building, but we learn, according to the book of Romans, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter number 8. The beloved apostle John, he said this in 1 John 4, 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Jude is telling us, boy, we're trying to build ourselves up. And by building ourselves up, we're going to have to spend time praying. And the way, according to what Paul told the Ephesians about prayer was, is you're going to have to have the, your loins covered with truth. You're going to have to have on the breastplate of righteousness. You're going to have to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're going to have to have on the helmet of salvation. You're going to have to have the sword of the Spirit so that you can pray the way that you ought to pray. 
He says here, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that what he said? That's exactly what he said. I'm mindful here as we conclude. I'm reminded of an Old Testament passage that kind of matches this. We find it back in the book of Nehemiah chapter number 4. Nehemiah chapter number 4. We learn in this that the Jews had come back to Jerusalem, were in the process of rebuilding the walls of the city. They'd already rebuilt the temple, but they noticed that the walls of the city were run down and no one was living in the city. So they started to work on the walls. But it came to pass that when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then were they very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Verse 9, Nevertheless we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Notice they went about in prayer. They went about in prayer. I'll show you that they're going to have on the whole armor of God. They have it, but they're praying. You know what they're doing? They're building the wall. And by building the wall of the city, they're also building up their own faith as they're doing the works that God has given to them. Verse 10, And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, For all places where ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places, behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people against the families with their swords, their spears, and their bows, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work. You know what they're doing? They're building. They're building and they weren't afraid. But you can see they have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. You can see that they were prepared for the battle that was to come. Jude is telling us that we need to build ourselves up. And by building ourselves up, we spend time with God in the right manner so that we make sure that our loins are girded with the truth and we understand what the, the truth is. John 4, 24, they that worship God in the spirit must worship him in spirit and in truth. So our loins are covered. We have on the righteousness of God because God has clothed us. So we have our, our chest, our, our big area covered with the righteousness of God. And in doing so, we're bold as lions. He has helped us and equipped us so that our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have on the helmet of salvation. We don't have head knowledge, but we have knowledge that we are saved and sealed under the day of redemption. We have a shield and we're supposed to be in prayer. Jude is telling us, boy, that we need to make sure that we build ourselves up. So I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what you're building on. But I hope that you're building on that relationship that God has with you. Hope that you're spending time in his word, meditating upon the word of God as God deals with you and ministers to you and grows you as your faith becomes more and more tangible each and every day and that you're able to help others that are weak in the faith. And the best way that you can do that and I can do that is to spend more and more and more time with God and thereby building ourselves up. And if we're not saved, how can we build ourselves up in a holy faith? We can't. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you'd help us be an encouragement to each of us as we spend more and more time with you as you help us to build up our faith. Lord, that we might be able to share with others that hope that lies within us, that we're able to give an answer to every man that asks. Lord, we pray that you'd help those that don't have that. Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, and today would be the day that they, they call out and cry out to you to save them. Lord, that they might start putting on that whole armor of God, being able to pray with all prayer and supplication. Lord, we just pray that you'd help each of us to apply this to our lives, that we might put it into practice. We ask this in your son's most precious name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking time to listen to Blessed Over Radio Broadcast. We hope that today's message was a blessing to you. I'd like to personally invite you to attend one of our church services. Our address is at 814 South Walson Lane, River Falls, Wisconsin. Follow us on Facebook at First Baptist Church RF, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube. We can be reached by telephone at area code 715-425-5220.
And I hope to see you real soon, either here, there, or in the air. God bless. We'll see you soon.